Welcome, Game Chasers, everywhere to episode 32 of the Collecting Confidant with your host, Gunstar Hero. And I'm back this week with something very unique and very close to my heart, especially in terms of the story of how I got this game and what it did to me when I finally decided to play it. This week, we're going to be talking about Undertale, which was developed and published by Toby Fox in conjunction with 8 to 4, a Japanese translation company, and also published physically by Fangamer, which of course has the physical version online now for the PS4, the PC, the Switch, and coming soon to the Xbox One. And of course, there is a PS Vita version as well for all you hardcore collectors too. We'll get into all that later, but first, Undertale. So the story behind me getting this game, and of course I do have the physical copy on the PS4, I had originally actually ordered Hollow Knight from Fangamer, all right, so this was a while back, and through some type of shipping accident, I ended up getting Undertale instead. So I kindly emailed Fangamer back, let them know about the situation, and even offered to send back my copy of Undertale as long as they would honor the original order. Well, to my delight, Fangamer's customer service turned out to be excellent. They told me, we're so sorry about the mistake. How about you just keep Undertale as a token of our apologies, and we'll send you another copy of Hollow Knight, which I got. So I figure that was probably meant to be. It was probably fate, and I felt, okay, because I was so impressed with the customer service and because the game's still available for purchase now, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk about this lovely RPG called Undertale that really just makes you question the whole genre and just flips everything on its head. So let's get into the game and why this is so, so special and why it's so beloved across the gaming community. So this game came out originally on September 15th, 2015 for Windows and Mac and eventually got Linux versions, PS4, Vita, Switch, and Xbox versions over the next few years. Now, this is a top-down old school RPG where essentially you play as this small child that was climbing Mount Ebbett and through an accident fell into this underground layer that is right below the Earth's surface where the monsters all roam. And what's happening with this layer is that you can't simply just get home because it is closed off from the Earth via a magical barrier in King Asgore's castle. So now you're going to have to quest out through this monster world, trying to find a way home, solving puzzles in the overworld along the way, and encountering all the various different monster inhabitants, whether you shop from them, simply converse with them, or encounter them in combat scenarios. And this is where the game gets truly unique and very interesting. So... First off, when you do encounter these monsters, when they attack you, this is the first unique part, you'll be engaging in a bullet hell shmup style scenario where you are represented like a little red heart in the middle of the playing field and all your enemies attacks, you have to dodge and avoid them like you do with any good bullet hell shooter. So right off the bat, that is such a unique way to approach RPG combat, but then it gets better from there. When it gets your turn to attack, you've got two options. You can either A, fight the monster traditionally like you do in any RPG and kill them and move on, or B, you can try to show mercy. And this is done very intuitively via an act menu where you have different choices to try to subdue the monster, or if that doesn't work, sometimes there's other scenarios where you simply just hit them, get them down to a low HP, but then eventually in either one, whether you get them down to low health or find the correct actions to try to subdue the monster, you'll have an option to spare the monster and avoid killing them altogether. So now... With this kind of mechanic in tow, you can see how the game becomes a bit of a morality play in terms of measuring how you engage with the monsters and ultimately what happens in your gameplay experience. And in terms of how it does affect your gameplay experience, whether you choose to let monsters live or die is going to affect the story, the dialogue, and especially the ending you're going to get. And there's three actually four major types of endings. There's the pacifist ending, which I did, and that's actually the one that's recommended that you start with, where you'll get the most enjoyment and experience out of the game. But then there's also a neutral ending, where if you kill at least one monster and then maybe spare the rest, you'll get that ending. There's also a more hardcore genocidal ending, where you have to kill 
every living thing within inside the world. You can't miss any one of them. You'll get a specific ending for that. And then finally, there is a hard mode where if you input a certain name for your character at the beginning, you'll be able to play a very hard version of the game's first area, similarly to what the original game demo was like when it originally came out prior to the game's official release. So, like I said, I decided to go with the pacifist run, and I'm glad I did so because... It was truly rewarding, and especially the post-game was one of the most lengthy, fruitful, and rewarding experiences where I truly felt that I was given something big for having made all the right choices throughout the game. So yes, I would definitely recommend that you do that first. And on top of that, the game has a very unique kind of meta narrative save system where it'll actually remember what you've done on previous playthroughs. So one thing I will suggest is if you want to do the genocidal run of the game, you may want to do that after you do the pacifist run because if you decide to do the genocidal run first, I've been told that your dialogue options will be affected and kind of tarnished by your previous actions if you decide to do the pacifist run later. So again, to truly get the best out of the game, I'd recommend doing the pacifist run and then trying other scenarios later. That's just my two cents. Now, in terms of development and history, this game was made by Toby Fox and he pretty much did most of the game in about 32 months. He did the development, the programming, he wrote the entire script, he did the entire game soundtrack and the majority of the art save for a few creatures and a bit of help by Tammy Chang. He was basically a one man show without any previous game development experience. He had done some work on RPG maker on the PlayStation back in the two thousands. He'd also done some hacks of earthbound, which is actually the main inspiration for this game, he admitted that fully. And he basically said that the biggest connection between Undertale and the Super Nintendo RPG classic Earthbound was the fact that it retains Earthbound's kind of weirdness and goofiness to the story and the dialogue, but also he recalls that Earthbound was very genuine and heartfelt, but had this kind of underlying tension. And that was something I picked up on immediately as soon as I started like the first few minutes of Undertale, when you encounter the flower that seems really cute and funny at first, but then turns completely evil. I definitely got this sense and this sense retained through my whole playing experience of being in a dream that you can't really make heads or tails out of that's a little weird have you ever had one of those dreams where you just doesn't make a lot of sense and it sticks with you after you've woken up making you feel almost a little horrified that's kind of how i felt where there's just this range of emotions all the time going through the game where at some points you'll be laughing out loud and then other points will be feeling grief there's so much going on and you truly can feel that this is no tourist passion project in the sense that Toby Fox's imprints all over this. The writing is just so very unique and idiosyncratic and it's definitely something that will stick with you even after you finish the game. I will say even after finishing the game like this doesn't happen very often. I wanted to immediately jump back in and just experience the world again because it just left me with so many conflicting emotions and so many impressions but it definitely stuck with me and, and that's the sign of truly great artwork. And I will say, if you finish this relatively short game and need more, there actually is a follow-up called Delta Rune, which you can get for free on PC, Mac, PS4, and Switch, and is available now for free download. There's two chapters that are available so far. The first chapter came out in 2018. Second chapter came out in 2021. This game is not necessarily a sequel to Undertale, but it requires you to have played Undertale to understand its context and its mechanics. And even though it's not a direct sequel, it does retain a lot of the elements, combat elements specifically, and a lot of the characters to kind of tie those two universes together. So eventually, when this game is finished, when all the chapters are complete, Toby Fox does intend to release this as a full package with an actual price tag. But like I said, if you want to sink your teeth into it now, you can do that for free digitally on the platform of your choice. So that's Undertale in a nutshell. Let's circle back to the physical buying options, which you can get via fangamer.com for pretty much the platform of your choice. And I'll go over those options. So right now there are both standard and collector's editions. The standard edition for the PS4 and the PC are both at $25 US with the Switch physical version being a little pricier at $29. And there's also an Xbox version 
TBA with no actual release date, but that's also going to clock in at $24 US. And then on top of that, there are going to be collector's editions for each of the platforms. The collectors for the PC and PS4 goes for $74. The one for the Switch goes for $79. And the Xbox One version will also go for $74. That collector's edition is going to include the base game, plus a big box, a CD soundtrack, some musical note liner sheets, and also a nice little pendant locket. So if you are a super fan of Undertale, you can get this all via fangamer.com. But I did mention that if you are one of those hardcore PSV Vita collectors, you can actually hop on over to play-asia.com and get a $60 US PS Vita version of Undertale while supplies last. So again, this is an RPG that really stuck with me, is definitely high art in the sense that it left me with a bunch of conflicting emotions and really made me question it for hours after I had finally finished it, like any great piece of art, really made me feel something. And just the fact that it was so refreshing to go through a game and be rewarded for making the right moral choices along every step of the way. I can't give this game enough accolades. It is something that I truly feel needs to be experienced if you are an RPG fan. And when people talk about this being on not only their game of the year list for 2018 when this came out, but also on their game of all time lists, I can see where they're going with this. This definitely has something about it that raises above other games in the genre, even though it flips that genre on its head. You've been watching episode 32 of The Collecting Confidant with your host, Gunstar Hero. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Later, game chasers, and peace.